And now, just letting you know, Don, that uh, Nick and I are here too. Oh, great, great, Annie. Uh, welcome and welcome, everyone. Hello, this is uh, part forty-nine, a special session, part two of our. Uh, uh, focus on telehealth, uh, otherwise getting health telehealthy at the library. Uh, we we are the Gigabit Libraries Network. We produce these in partnership with uh, IFLA uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, these are all recorded and posted on giglibraries.net at the pandemic response page. Have a look. This will be up by Monday and all prior 47 sessions are there now. Our se session sponsor, Kelly Dry. DC law firm that's helped us with a number of filings doing pro bono uh, in return for their sponsorship. Uh, this was the session last week with Annie, Nick, Diane, and Craig uh, giving us a ton of information. I highly recommend uh, having a look at it, uh, the recorded session. Uh, there was so much we couldn't get through it, so we decided to schedule a special session, aka part two. And uh, we started with the question, what is telehealth mean and you know it's it's this use of telecommunications to interact with with health providers that has become a standard practice now uh, but one that's difficult and if you don't have the the setup in your home to do uh, I've done a number of these already I think they've become standard practice I think the the providers appreciate this because it's a little more efficient it saves a lot of travel time. It's not the same thing as being in person, but like with a lot of technology, you get a, you get a, a, a thinner experience, but you get, it's much more convenient. You can do much more in that sense. So it's, we're evolving into yet another kind of hybrid model, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, but the libraries have been called to step in to help people get set up, have a place to connect, help them get loaded and, and make their appointments. Um, before we get to the, to the regular session, I wanted to highlight this article in the Atlantic. You can search for it. The, I, I wanted to post the URL, but it was like three lines long, but just search for that. This is an excellent article and, uh, it's, it's about the, I, I don't know if we can call it the aftermath because I feel like we're still in the pandemic. Maybe it's kind of, we're in a long COVID period here where it's, Again, another hybrid. People are getting vaccinated. People are not getting vaccinated. And so we're in all these different mix of, we were all in one state in the beginning. And then we began to evolve, get vaccinated, not vaccinated, resist, hang out, travel. All these things are in different stages and states depending on where you are and when you are. Um, but overall, we've all been through this psychological experience. I mean, we've experienced it in different ways, but uh, this article points to a number of factors that we just wanted to pay attention to. We think it's a really excellent article. This guy, Ed Young, has done more to illuminate the various aspects of the pandemic than anybody else uh, we've seen. Uh, probably the first to really bring attention to the long COVID phenomena. Uh, people are quite not quite a known percentage of people who've been treated with uh, COVID, but have had lingering symptoms for months or longer uh, since an original uh, infection and treatment. Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just, uh, we, we, we still, <laughs> your, your slides still aren't moving on, and you're not. Uh, uh, I'm just okay. I got a full day. Okay, so, well, I'll just go through this. It's all right. Could you, could you click down them just so we see the right slide? You seeing a slide change? No, not yet. Uh, I'm... We're, only seeing the, we're only seeing the back end of the slides. Back end? So the, 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 the editing page where you edit them. Uh, if they had a, fed, a training schedule, I don't remember seeing anything for TSLA. Oh, nuts. So what do you see now? Now we've got the definition of telehealth, what it means. All right. So you see that slide? What yes, this is, the, art, this is the, Atlant the Atlantic article. Right. Okay. Don't know what that is. So I was pointing out this article 
that I suggest everybody read. That's the title, What Happens When Americans Can Finally Exhale. Uh, and this author is, is just phenomenal, insight, detail. This is a long article, but it's full of great stuff. And the point of just talking about this a little bit is that a lot of people think, well, we're coming out of it. Yeah, that's true in, in some levels, but uh, this article makes the point there are a lot of things we've yet to actually experience and face. So this classic uh, phenomena of when you're in a crisis and the adrenaline fades, then uh, so-called normalcy comes, but you're really not ready for this kind of aftermath. And, the, uh, and so this is when these kind of traumas can come in and, and wreak havoc. Um, we talked about last year, we talked about these cascading crises of uh, the, the social unrest after the Floyd killing, the hurricanes, the fires in California, it just, they just kept coming and they haven't really gone away. As we know, the, you know, the, at least the, the climate driven extreme weather conditions have not uh, abated. They seem to pay no attention to the pandemic and we're just entering into a new season of fires and, and, uh, storms. Um, and we're still dealing with this collective trauma, if we can. Uh, this UC professor that's quoted here, uh, Roxanne Silver, uh, we hope to get her on to talk about this. The point is that, that there are a lot of people that are library patrons that are going through this. You yourselves, we all as individuals may be ha experiencing different uh, levels of this uh, stress, this post-traumatic stress, if it has actually is post-traumatic. And so we're is we're not putting ourselves forward as counselors, and this is not really a counseling session, uh, but in fact, it's the backdrop for the whole series. This is this thing is going on. What does it mean, and what do we do about it? We focus more on the on the the library responses and the recovery strategies, especially around the use of technology to extend access. But this is the underlying social phenomena that we've we've touched on and we've touched on that in the context of the libraries their role in the social infrastructure uh, we had eric kleinenberg on talking about that and and we've touched on it with a number of different sessions it's an important role for libraries uh, as they play as as anchors in their communities so these are some things that are i've just pulled these out of the article uh, did that advance there is that a new slide does it does it say silver found? Is that the first line? We're still seeing your back end. So I, I would just stop share, stop the play and work with the back end. Okay. Okay. All right. So sharing the back end. So is that up? Do you see that? Yes, we're seeing the Ed Gold. Sil Silver found is the first line on the? Yes. Okay, well, that's the second. And next to the last slide, sorry about this snafu, we'll try to straighten it out. Uh, but um, it, Silver, the psychologist at uh, UC Irvine found that even communities that go through extreme traumas such as years of uh, daily rocket fire can show low levels of PTSD, which is interesting because we're starting to show you know, reactions here across society. Uh, but the, she points out that there are factors that seem to protect people from having these extreme traumas. And those are uh, uh, confidence in authorities. This is a difficult one. Uh, belonging, maybe. The community solidarity is the one I want to point out here because of the role that libraries can play in building solidarity. So think about that in recovery. <clears throat> um, this is a common reaction. You know, we've just kind of hit a pause button. We went through this thing. So now we're going back to normal. We've never said that was predictable, a reasonable prediction. We've, there's some new phenomena, new normal that we're going to be entering into. And we don't quite know what it is. We don't quite know how people are going to react to it or, or the kind of choices they're going to make. Um, but we do, we do hope to see some upsides of this. Uh, an opportunity to reset for people to revisit, you know, the things that are meaningful in their lives. 
Um, family connections have, have, of course, been both suffering and recovering and reviving and maybe finding new levels of engagement at the family and the family that never existed before because we were kind of forced to be with each other for so long. Uh, phys more physical activity. I mean, where I live, there are more people riding bicycles than you can believe. People are getting outside, that's healthy. Family meals, that could be healthy. More focus on you know, work-life balance. Uh, I read an article the other day, it said the optimum number of days in the office is two, meaning three you know, remotely and then two actually in the environment. That would give people much more time to do the kind of things that they have to squeeze in in a five-day work week and those hours between and on the weekends. And, you know, everybody's going to find their own balance of, of what they need or uh, what they're able to do. Uh, and we're seeing a greater flexibility being offered to employees, especially now, it really seems like when there's more demand for, for uh, people doing different kinds of jobs. Um, and this last one, this old saw, necessity leads to invention. So things are being created, really interesting, innovative things. And uh, so uh, we're hopeful, but we want to make the point that because this, this processing hasn't really happened on a large scale yet, we're just suggesting it's reasonable for everybody to kind of pay attention to how, how uh, staff is feeling, how patrons are feeling. If they're in crisis, they're going to tend to show up at the library and understanding what they're going through, this, you know, this uh, Kubler-Ross model of grief, you know, these stages of grief, it doesn't seem to be kind of linear. It seems like reality is that people kind of jump around to these different stages of denial, acceptance, and so forth. So uh, I recommend the article uh, that uh, I'll highlight again here what happens when Americans can finally exhale, good reading. And um, so maybe that'll help people cope, prepare and deal with what's coming next. Cause we're into uh, uh, a new season of, of uh, weather driven uh, crises that uh, we're still, you know, like it or not. And they're making the point, well, why, <laughs> We've been through all this, we're tired. Why should we have to you know, do all this work? Well, there's just no avoiding it. So uh, I, I don't know if that's really an optimistic message. I hope it's just sort of a realistic message that's helpful, but I can't, uh, I can't say more than that other than I hope we actually get Professor Silver on and she can walk us through some of this maybe in a, in a month or so. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Stephen uh, Stephen Weiber, uh, head of public policy for IFLA and our, our co our partner in the production of these sessions. Stephen did an interview, uh, with, uh, library association representative in Australia to talk about telehealth. And we also have back, uh, several of our speakers from last week who we're going to ask to maybe respond to the, to the video that Stephen's about to play and going to set up for us right now. So Stephen, take it away. Thank you very much, Don. And just to give you a very brief introduction, the interview today is with Nicole Barnes, who's the business manager at the Australian Library and Information Association. And we reached out to her um, to do a video because I think right now it is 20 past one in the morning for them. So obviously it's not ideal for a live conversation. Um, but they've been doing some really interesting work at the national level in order to get libraries involved in telehealth policies. And, and this is always interesting. There's quite a lot happening at the local level, but to get that recognition at the level of a G20 country is always something interesting. So um, a, a couple of uh, Mayor Corpus caveats before starting this. Um, I can't necessarily control the volume. And so it's a little bit loud. So I recommend maybe that you reduce your volume a little bit so you don't get a pleasant shock. Um, I also apologize for the fact that I did this first thing in the morning just after getting up. So I um, please feel free to close your eyes when I'm there. I was also unfortunately forced to record on a mobile phone. So there are a couple of elements, but anyway, I'm going to share and then start the video now once it's actually working. There we go. So 
Hello, Nicole. Thank you for joining us in order to talk a little bit about the work that's taking place between the Australian Library and Information Association and the Australian Digital Health Alliance. Um, as explained, this is part of a, this recording is going to be uh, used as part of a, a webinar, a series of webinars that are taking place looking at some of the questions, some of the issues that come up at the intersection of libraries, digital, and in particular COVID-19. And looking and really trying to understand some of the roles that libraries can play in a digital world and a post-COVID world. And certainly the news things that I've certainly read about what's been going on in Australia are it's extremely interesting as a model of this collaboration of an effort really to realize the potential of libraries to support a sort of more inclusive, more equitable digital world, to really realize the potential of digital in a way that benefits everyone. So I guess. Just to start off, firstly, um, I'd ask you quickly to introduce yourself. Sure. Thank you, Stephen. Um, my name is Nicole Barnes and I am the um, Business Director here at the Australian Library and Information Association. And I am managing the project between um, the Australian Public Library Alliance, the Australian Library and Information Association, the Australian Digital Health Agency, um, yeah, as we have partnered to um, help uh, consumers better understand the um, use of their My Health record. Excellent. So can you give me a quick idea first of how health and wellbeing is, is structured in Australia? Sure. Look, health is a split responsibility between federal, state and territory governments in Australia. The federal government runs Medicare, a payment scheme which covers public hospital charges and contributes to people's prescription medicines. Uh, it regulates private health insurance, supports primary health services and subsidies, um, that was wrong, and subsidises aged care. State and territory governments manage public hospitals, run preventative health, ambulance and emergency services. Preventative health measures and consumer education programs have become a big part of Australia's health strategy at the federal, state and territory level. Local governments are increasingly looking at community wellbeing as a um, measure of success. Excellent. And, and what about digital health initiatives? How are those set up currently? Uh, the Australian Digital Health Agency is the federal government agency um, with the aim of encouraging collaboration and connecting healthcare providers through digital technologies to support a healthier future um, here in Australia. Australians are, uh, Australians are encouraged to have a MyGov account, um, which gives them easy access to um, online tax records, um, benefits, other government services, and their My Health record. The My Health um, record is completed by doctors and other healthcare providers. And it gives people a fully transportable um, record of their health conditions, treatment and medications. Excellent. And so before this collaboration came about, how much do you think was known about the role, the potential role of libraries in supporting health and well-being within the library field? So amongst individual librarians at the association level. Public and health libraries have always provided health um, information. In community, we have worked with partners such as uh, the Cancer Council, Autism Australia and many others. To focus people's attention on prevention and adopting healthier lifestyles, this is increasingly a part of the life. Excellent. Okay. And it, it's really good to know that, that that's been taken on. As I think certainly some of our audience in the US will also feel this, will know this increasingly well recognised and certainly a role that's existed for some time, but certainly a role that's become more recognised in this area. What about the role, what about among governments and health providers themselves? Do you think that they had really understood this potential for libraries to support their work here? Look, with government and health providers, no, um, not so much. But, you know, with our, um, with our partnership, I think... Um, you know, well, certainly this is a great opportunity for us to produce a, um, you know, a really good case study um, to show the reach um, and support that libraries have in the community. And so, I don't know, 
go going into the concrete example of the partnership that that you're leading on at the moment um how did this relationship with the Australian Digital Health Alliance come about? How did you bring them on side to working with libraries? Look, over many years, Stephen, you know, we have made several submissions um, to government around health um, and the role of libraries um, played in supporting the, the community. And um, for us, uh, you know, we, um, we certainly... Um, you know, demonstrated and, and wanted government to understand that around Australia we've got 1,500 shop fronts. That's a, that's a really powerful. And I, I, I'm sure this is certainly a message that others will understand this importance of sometimes it's persistence that often it's up to, it is definitely up to libraries to show what they can do, to show what they can actually contribute. And, and the shop fronts argument is a really interesting, it's a really yeah. interesting one here that you actually have those those points that people see. Absolutely, absolutely. And then how do you think, in terms of, I don't know, clearly things have changed, I don't know, we've been in an extraordinary situation. I know that the Australian government has dealt with COVID in a way that I'm sure many other governments, um, many other governments will be envious of. Nonetheless, I'm assuming there has been an effect from COVID. What, what, what's this meant for how, what's this meant for how you're, you're how this project, how this collaboration has gone forward? Well, originally, um, you know, uh, the project and the training um, was actually designed as a face-to-face -face, uh, train the trainer model. And um, when the initial impact of COVID was felt early last year, um, the project did pause for a little while. We then realised that, you know, this was going to be a much longer um, impact and we... Um, it developed the the face to face training. We turned it into an online um, version, which included all of the information that was um, you know that we were going to provide to people in the in person sessions. Uh, as it turns out, the online version has been um, a greater success in terms of the number of library staff trained. And just going slightly off the list of, of questions received now, is it? You talk about the number of staff trained. This is allowing you to reach further to different types of libraries in different parts of the country. We think, um, look, it's, we've had a greater reach to the library staff um, and we've also had um, a lot of community service providers, um, you know, have become aware of our training um, as well. And we certainly, you know, didn't just limit the, um, the availability to library staff. So we were very happy to, to share it with community our service providers, and when I say that, you know, there have been um, uh, many community um, providers uh, like Alcoholics Anonymous, um, you know, um, community um, centres, and you know, just other sort of help organisations. So it's had a, a much um, much greater reach than what we initially anticipated. That's really encouraging. I think it, I think it's one of the conclusions we've certainly had at the IFLA level from the crisis that actually doing things in this way allows you, because there's not the sense that you have to be in the room to be part of it, suddenly that breaks down a huge barrier to a lot of people getting involved. Um, yeah. And so, as, as you mentioned a couple of times, I knew this is all about training librarians. This is about supporting them to do their job, to, 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 to take part, to actually deliver this sort of information, this sort of service. What's actually covered in the training? Um, we go into, um, you know, just getting connected to the My Health Records. So that's through the, um, the government uh, MyGov portal. Um, and then there is an in-depth overview of how the My Health Record works. Um, we also go into privacy and security as that was um, one of the areas that a lot of Australians were very concerned about. Um, you know, when looking at their, um, you know, their very personal health records online. Um, health and wellbeing resources um, and for library staff to be able to incorporate this training um, into existing library programming. Um, so, you know, when I say that, I mean including some of this training in um, we have programs here in Australia, Tech Savvy Seniors, and um, you know the Be Connected program. And is there, I suppose, the 
once librarians have received this training, this, this is going off, off, off the list of questions here, but once librarians have received this training, the idea is that they should be, there should be, I don't know, focused programs on it. Are, is there an expectation that people will start coming to libraries in order to understand what's going on? It'll be more reactive in terms of sharing this information. It was it was about um you know sort of um, better informing library staff to be able to help the consumers. Um, focused uh, workshops is not something that that we um, thought would get a lot of traction. Um, so that's why our suggestion was to sort of leverage this training off ex existing programs. So you know just, just sharing a bit of the information at the end of um, you know just general. Um, digital literacy. I, I think, yeah, I, I, I think I think that makes that makes good sense here. I, I don't imagine there's many people wanting to go to a workshop on government programs about health. No, no, no Stephen, and um, you know, really, when we had some frank discussions, um, we felt that if we were, you know, trying to run dedicated my health record training workshops, that actually there would be a very very small um, amount of interest. That sounds about right. And what, what do you anticipate the results of, of this work being in terms of the service off, services offered and I suppose also about um, into their impact in terms of health outcomes and, and how this is being measured? Well, um, so in terms of services offered, um, you know, just that our this, that library staff can feel more confident when providing guidance um, about my health record and um, about trusted health and wellbeing resources more broadly. Um, a reportable and measurable way of aligning with council's health and wellbeing strategies, um, and. Yeah, just those those new and enhanced relationships with um, with local healthcare providers. It's an interesting point you make there about being aligned with local council objectives on on well being. I guess I hope I suppose hopefully in the long term. I, I've just put a word into your mouth here. One of the ideas is that it's making the library look even more indispensable to all parts of local government, so not just the education or the culture parts that traditionally tend to deal with libraries. Indeed. I mean, libraries are, you know, um, very much at the heart of community and, um, you know, they're such trusted spaces that you know, that is where so many people go, um, you know, to ask very simple questions. And I said, is there, and I, I suppose I mentioned earlier, I talked a little bit about the role within the library field. Is this an area where actually you get a sense that librarians are already being asked questions? So people are coming in to use the computers and want to set this up, but people coming in using the computers, taking part in things and, and aware that this is an option. They're trying to ask librarians what's actually going on. How do I do this? What's Definitely. We see a lot of that um, here in Australia. And and I think it's, um, you know, it's been um, said over and over again that often government departments, um, you know, will just send send people down to the local library for, you know, um, all sorts of information. So, you know, th this project for us is that case study that, you know, that we can show to other government departments that, you know, yes, we can help um consumers with all sorts of things but our library staff need to be trained in order to be providing you know that the right information um you know and that training uh, um is is easier for us to roll out if we have some funding and i think that i know that it, it, it's I know it, again it's something that we see around the world and the point you make about government agencies just sending people down the road to the libraries is it's certainly something that's been said quite a few times in the in the context of the series of webinars that, that, that this interview will be part of. I guess the interesting thing is it's making it's it's con it's convincing that okay, it's trying to get beyond the way in which libraries are seen as a, a public good by government agencies as a, a nice free thing that they can rely on, they don't have to pay for in order to actually achieve their goals, but moving from that. Sort of free riding 
on the fact that libraries are there and available to actually providing the support to allow libraries to provide services in a more sort of in a, I know, I wouldn't, I'm not going to say professional way, but in a better informed way, in a more skilled way, in a more effective way. You know, that, that's a really, it's a really positive, it's a really fascinating example of libraries elsewhere in the world. Yes, I mean, you know, that, that's what, um, you know, that's what we think. And, um, you know, and libraries, I, I think um, governments also need to understand that, you know, libraries just in, in the number of staff and the resources they have, you know, um, you know, they they can't just be there for everybody, you know, all the time without funding and without the correct um, information to be able to share with others. I think that's. It's also welcome to see that, and there are government departments and agencies realizing that providing access to information isn't just it isn't necessarily a simple thing. There need to be skills. There needs to be support as well. I don't know the, the fact that you're offering training and that you've been able to, to, to work with the Australian Digital Health Agency to, to show that training is important and needs to be supported is also welcome. I think we often see governments assuming that simply you put the information out there and people will understand it and use it. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's, there's a number of people in, you know, across the world who have lower um you know digital literacy skills you know and often those people um require one-on-one -on -one assistance um you know so it's not not quite as simple as you know just handing somebody a brochure with some information and expecting them to be able to um you know understand it and and there are security and passwords and all sorts of things that you know people have to learn about you, you mentioned briefly actually in your answers earlier teaching about privacy and I know that's obviously a it's an issue that, that that's it's, it's an issue that really matters for people around the world I know that speaking from personal experience the UK is a effort to come up with digital health records basically sank because no one trusted it and then there was a sense that it was risk infringing privacy and so people too many people decided to opt out of actually including their information in there can you say anything about the sort of the elements of the training the, uh, around privacy and how it's possible to, to, to build awareness of what's in there and allow people to make informed choices? Well, the, the My Health Record, it's a health summary for one thing um, and I think it's, um, it's often sort of um, thought about as a, as a complete sort of health record. So firstly, not everything has to be uploaded to your health summary and you, in fact, have a choice um, of saying that, no, I don't want that to be part of my health record if it is something that is sensitive in, in the health space. Um, so it's making people aware of that. There was the, the my health record received some fairly um, negative media attention um, here in Australia and privacy was the big one. And, you know, there were all sorts of um, media articles being written about, you know, um, the government selling off information to insurance companies and, and those kinds of things. So, you know, it, it, we do touch on the privacy and that it's very much in an individual's control. Um, here in Australia, you, um, you, by the age of 14, you're in charge of your own health record too. So you can um, make a decision that your parents can no longer see it. Um, so, you know, for teenagers perhaps, you know, moving into the, the world of taking contraception, they don't necessarily want their parents to see, they can do those kinds of things as well. Um, but as I say, again, you know, not everything has to be loaded to you. My, my health record, if you don't want it to. And, and it's interesting, and again, this is another area where I know there's, there's a huge interest in the library field in general, but knowing how to, inform patron inform users knowing how to help users exercise those choices and and giving them the tools to do that without telling them what to do is again it's an area that does require some skill um it doesn't come that it, it's not something that people automatically know all the time so it's really and it's positive it's a really interesting thing that this is part of your training yeah yeah it really is and um you know we have seen a number of our library staff um, you know, they're, um, 
opinions on the My Health Record change after doing the the training and that they, you know, were going to go home and, um, you know, help their parents set it up because they could see the value in it um, and those kinds of things. So it's certainly, um, you know, it, it, it's it's a slow pro- slow working progress, but it is a working progress. Just thinking about the overall so look and feel isn't quite the right way of saying it. As I know, clearly libraries are public services, but often they are seen as more approachable because they don't have a hospital or police station or unemployment or job seekers centre written above the door, which means that people don't see them as being quite as intimidating as, a, as an official public service with a title. Yeah, it, it, it's... it's I guess, I don't know, to, to what extent is there a balance to be found between I know, promoting a government service, supporting the use of a government service and maintaining that sense of we're focused on the user rather than on delivering government policy, which is one of the elements that makes life is sort of so attractive? Mm. Um, you know, I think when we, um, when we were talking to the um, Digital Health Agency, we certainly wanted to make it very clear that our role wasn't to promote the use of anything um, simply it was to as a support service and you know there's no promotion and there's really no um, you know we we don't have library staff sort of walking up to library patrons with my health record brochures the moment they walk in the door or anything like that so look it, it is strictly a support program yeah which i think it makes a lot of sense and but the fact that it's then it's still welcome that the, 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 the Australian Digital Health Agency saw this nonetheless as being valuable, the libraries can respond is, is really interesting. I guess the, the final question I've, I've got in my head at the moment is, do you see other areas where this sort of approach could be valuable? Are there other areas of service where you're, I guess you're conscious that, that libraries are being asked questions about how to do it, how to benefit from this, this program, that program? and where there could be value in, in being able to support training for librarians? Um, look, I think um, here we are, you know, there's a, there's a whole new, there's a whole revision of the National Digital Health Strategy. And, um, you know, things are being rolled out, um, you know, in the digital space all the time. We, in Australia, there's a pilot at the moment for scripts to all be um, sent to people digi- digitally. Um, you know, so I see this, um, you know, the whole um, digital health space just becoming bigger and bigger. Um, and as it becomes, you know, as, as there's more and more things that you have to access online, um, you know, I just see the need for ongoing um, support to library staff for them to be able to continue to support the community um, you know, as, as everyone sort of tries to come to terms, particularly um, older people, with, you know, everything now sort of having to be accessed online. Perfect. So thank you very much. I've, I really appreciate your time, your explanations. And I, I think, as I've said before, it, it's in, in, in our emailing, it's fascinating. It's really encouraging to see this sort of initiative taking place at the national level because, so often maybe there'll be local collaborations going on and things that we don't necessarily hear about because it's really happening on the ground but to see that recognition at a national level federal level even of this role of libraries is something that I know hopefully can provide a model elsewhere hopefully can provide a model within the US within other countries and so I'm glad I'm very glad that we've been able to record this you know I hope it provides inspiration and, and support for others in thinking about which digital health agencies they can pester to, to, to make sure that they recognise this value of libraries and they recognise the value of providing that extra support to libraries in, a, in order to be able to support digital health and other digital initiatives. So I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add, otherwise we can close the recording. And No, thank you very much, um, Stephen. It's been good to be able to talk about it. And I think, um, I think from... The perspective of a peak body, um, you know, it's great to be involved in a in a project, and it's great, it, it, you know, um, it was really wonderful that the Digital Health Agency was able to provide adequate funding 
um, you know, for a um, training program to be developed, um, you know, as a, you know, you know, as a, um, I suppose, a testament to how valuable libraries are in, um, you know, in supporting their community. Perfect. So with that, I just want to say thank you and um, uh, I will share with the, when, when we actually um, put this out on the webinar, I will include links to materials from Alia in the in the chat box so that people can follow up and see what's going on there. But with that, I will close the recording. Great. Thank you. Great job, Stephen. That was, that was great. Uh, and I think you, please thank Nicole for us. I mean, profusely, I thought that was a, a great story and it, you know, added context, you know, the solidarity, we're all kind of, this is a global phenomenon, we're dealing it around the world and, and uh, the time difference here to actually hear from Asia, Australia is, is a super challenge. Uh, and I, I think your point that you both touched on, uh, we've talked about, you know, people seeking help at the library for different, you know, crises and, and we hadn't really thought about government agencies seeking help from the library, but in fact, that's what they're doing by, by offloading so much of this information sharing and guidance to the libraries without, uh, without really collaborating at the level to do that, to that properly and offering the resources to do it. I think you've opened up uh, a whole area for us to, to do a whole session on this government free riding on the, on the libraries, some, some, some title like that. But uh, uh, I wanted to uh, ask our presenters from last week, Nick and, and Diane and Annie to respond to the, to Nicole's presentation. But first I wanted to uh, recognize uh, Crosby uh, Kemper, the IMLS director, is on with us today and, and see if Crosby had uh, a response or anything to say about this this whole topic. Crosby, are you there? Yeah. Uh, hi, Don. Thanks. Uh, it, it, as Don knows, I'm always ready to say something about anything. But, <laughs> uh, so I, 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 since I'm not a part of the, the, the actual agenda here, and there, there are people who know more about this subject than I do, I'll, I'll try and be, be brief. Uh, couple of things. One, uh, that I think is of general interest to, to your audience, uh, Don, and, and you know this, uh, the, the, the budgets of the federal government in the United States have uh, ad adopted an attitude of uh, uh, endorsing the idea we've been selling for years and years that the internet is essential, an essential utility. A uh, huge amount of money is flowing through the federal government right now. That's the good news. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about this next week in a, a, a press conference we'll do once the tomorrow the Biden administration will release its first budget. Uh, it's, it's called the skinny budget, the re revision of the current year budget. Um, and uh, I'll be talking about this. Uh, that, that's the good news. The bad news is from a library point of view is that the word library doesn't occur often enough in the budget lines, uh, in, the, in the enabling legislation for uh, most of the budget lines here. Uh, there's a huge amount of money flowing through various places. Uh, a lot will be going uh, to, to states, to the governors essentially, um, and libraries and, and state broadband authorities. And state health authorities and what we're talking about today uh, need, need to get together uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to work on not merely connectivity. Connect we sort of won the connectivity uh, debate. It really is now more about what we're talking about today, which is getting information and skills uh, to the folks, the underserved, under-resourced parts of uh, uh, of our country. And, and I think this is true worldwide, but this is the specific U.S. problem. Um, the, the second thing I would say uh, is uh, uh, our experience at the IMLS, we created, uh, as we've talked about before uh, in your meetings, uh, the Realm Project uh, as a response to the, the, the pandemic. Uh, we saw the CDC, Johns Hopkins and others were doing webinars with Smithsonian and Library of Congress, et cetera, at the beginning of the pandemic. And, and the government health agencies 
we're not addressing specific library and museum problems. And so we created the Realm Project, did real research at Battelle uh, uh, and, uh, and, and with the OCLC, uh, tried to make this information available to libraries and museums. The one thing, uh, I'll say two things about that. One is I, I think we, we did help in terms of reopening protocols, people understanding uh, what happens with books and, and surfaces, et cetera. We, we influenced the, informed the CDC's fomite research. You know, you're not, your, your, your tabletop, uh, your desktop, your counter is not probably a ma major communicator of, uh, of the virus, et cetera. We, we had an influence mm -hmm. on that. And, uh, and obviously on, on the circulation of books, et cetera. Uh, but it, it's also very obvious that uh, the, uh, the informatics of the, of the pandemic have been really awful. And I mean, coming from the top down from the CDC, the CDC's latest guideline about outdoors um, has been heavily correctly criticized. It's not based on the actual science. Uh, it's based on... Uh, a political interpretation, a, a very specific kind of political interpretation of uh, of the of the science. I we don't want to get in trouble, um, and and that and that's been going, and that makes it really difficult for librarians, in particular, uh, I think, to uh, to inform people uh, and, and inform their own staffs. So one of the biggest problems in the library world in the United States certainly has been the fear of frontline staff. Uh, uh, about reopening uh, when information about uh, uh, about the uh, the epidemiology of the virus is still so uh, confusing. It's it's a lot less confusing today, and we now know that uh, with minimal social dif distancing and mask wearing, uh, we're, we're, most people are in pretty good shape. Uh, but but it's been a very it's been a very difficult thing, I think, from an information point of view. Uh, for for librarians and uh, trust the trust the science when the scientists are disagreeing is uh, is is difficult. Um, and then the, the last thing I would say, um, and uh, I, I will say, one of my heroes in this in this regard is is on this call is Diane Connery and what Pottsboro has done. Um, one of the things I think we've learned is that things like information about the pandemic, the response to the pandemic. Are best answered at the local level. Uh, local healthcare authorities uh, and local partnerships with people who are both delivering the healthcare service, and this is true in other areas, but just using healthcare as an example. Libraries are really good at partnering, uh, and most of the successful things we've seen in the successful projects that we've funded uh, at, at the IMLS have been uh, about local partnerships. Uh, with local healthcare authorities, with cities, school districts, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and that's a direction that at the IMLS will continue to go is encouraging uh, partnerships, including partnerships between our, our two service areas of libraries and museums um, and, uh, uh, and, and do as much as we can at the local level, so. Excellent. Thank you, Crosby. and. Uh... Uh, that's good news, of course, about the new funds flowing through uh, to benefit libraries. Uh, we know a lot of those are going through IMLS, and it's creating a stress, another yet another stress to just process that. People don't think about what it takes to actually move those funds uh, intelligently and, and effectively. And we're going to have you back. I think we've got you scheduled in August right. sometime. You can give us an update on how that's all going. But, and I do want to say one other thing oh, in case any members of Congress or the administration are listening uh, today is we, we doubled the size of the agency with our CARES Act and ARPA, ARPA funds without adding a single employee. So we, we, we were a good example of efficiency in the, in the federal government for once. So I want to, I want to say something on behalf of the staff at IMLS who's having to do Double the work, you know, it's not easy. It was already a, a challenge. Uh, so we'll look forward to they're, that. They're all in therapy now. Yes, yes. So it must be kind of quiet around the office. <laughs> I know it is anyway. Uh, so thanks, Crosby. Now let's let's see what uh, what we uh, can hear. What kind of responses we might get from 
from uh, Diane, and Nick, and, and Annie about uh, the topic in general or the presentation from Nicole in Australia. Uh, uh, Annie, are you still on? Yep, I'm here. Hello, hi. and hi, Crosby. It's good to see you. Um, so my reaction is, um, of, of, of course, it's a lot about uh, training for librarians and to train the public, training librarians to train the public. And the example reminded me of when uh, job applications all went online. I can remember our state personnel department announced, um, okay, all, all job applications are online. And by the way, you can go to your library to get help with that. Well, of course, um, you know, we're glad to be included, but um, there was not training for that. And there was, the big point was there's no money to go with that. And so, um, and, and as Crosby points out, I think a lot of the bills that come out that go to other departments um, don't, even if they include the word libraries, they don't mandate it. And so uh, we don't necessarily get it. So since we presented uh, last week for telehealthy part one, I, I did have a meeting this week uh, Alta and I had met with a couple people from DHSS. They had requested a meeting with us to, uh, they want to hand out uh, COVID kits. They've gotten, you know, a big pot of money. They want to hand out COVID kits to the public. And of course, that sounds pretty simple. But I mentioned, I said, well, you know, is, is it possible to get some money for libraries for that? And their library supporters, and he threw out, oh, yeah, maybe $10,000 per library. And I'm thinking, that's good. <laughs> uh, and, you know, we kind of ran with that. I, don't, I think he's backpedaling a little bit on the amount he threw out there. But, um, you know, it's, it's the point that, I mean, we're, uh, we've been doing this for a while. We're getting to another level, and we need to um, go a little deeper with these relationships and, and how, how they're supported and how they're funded. And uh, we talked with the directors about it this morning, and it's like we just need to figure out the angles and how to talk about it and how to get that money uh, secured uh, for those partnerships. So, uh, so thank you. And, and Nick, did you uh, have anything to? Uh, add well, I just on? want to pick up on that, Annie. I think you may make a great point there that that perhaps the the information crisis that the pandemic represents and the roles that libraries are being cast into may create an understanding that this is not the only circumstance and that that is in fact something that needs to be, you know, codified as, as new programs are rolled out in any agency, that this will make that example pretty clear. Yeah, Nick. Yeah, I guess I just wanna, uh, I guess, pose a thought that's on my mind related to our project. And I'm curious if Diane um, thinks the same way. I brought this up to Patty Wong yesterday uh, at ALA. So we're, we're doing all these great initiatives, uh, telehealth related, um, but we're also seeing just people nervous about just coming back into the library. So we're, we're doing all this marketing and we're putting a lot of effort into that um, and educating people about what they could use telehealth or teleservices for. Um, but the traffic, foot traffic in the door is just low right now. Um, so I'm curious what we could do, what thoughts are about that. If there needs to be campaigns specific to the libraries are open again, um, what everybody's thoughts are. Well, we might open that up to everybody uh, in a minute. Uh, an interesting question, of course. Uh, Diane, what are you, are you marketing that the library is now safe to come back to? Yes, um, and really here is small town Texas, we've been open the whole time. Everything's pretty much as normal. So that has not been an issue for us, but I did pick up on that um, from what she was saying. If I understood her correctly, Nicole, she said something about a public information education about what telehealth is and, and I, if, if I understood her correctly, that is a need because A, a lot of people don't wanna go see a healthcare provider anyway. And then if they have low digital literacy skills, they may have additional anxiety about using computers. So um, we have not had the utilization that I know the need is there for. But in our case, I don't think it is because people are afraid to come into the library. I think it's 
It's how do people who don't use computers regularly wrap their head around what, what telehealth is. And, you know, I often <laughs> am guilty of thinking I have an original idea. And then I see something like this, a fantastic video, and it's like, oh, they're way ahead of us. So um, I, that is the purpose of the community of practice is so that we can all share those ideas. And we do have, I think from what she was saying, a slightly more complicated picture in the US when she was talking about my health, it sounded like one platform. And mm -hmm. in the US, we have so many different um, you know, platforms. They would all share a lot in common, but when we are training librarians, it wouldn't be just one platform that we're training in. Great points. Um, I can follow up to Diane's point, Don. Um, you know, one thing that I think we had going for us pre-COVID, so if we had telehealth pre-COVID, this might've been a different situation, but um, deploying social workers um, with, our, with our connections with the Department of Health and Social Services, I think what that allows is a pipeline for patrons to stay within the library confines to get all their services. So, you know, a barrier to telehealth could be health insurance. Well, if they can go to the social worker or a case manager, sign up with health insurance and then say, okay, now go over to the telehealth kiosk, telehealth room and get your health care. Um, you know, so to continue to provide the wraparound services within the confines of the library. Uh, excellent. And, and again, uh, representing a potential template for a whole range of public services and public information to, to encode the library role in the delivery of that and have these processes spelled out so they're not just, you know, just pointing to the library. Let's go to the library, they'll help you. It's just not, it's just not adequate. Uh, funding should go along with collaboration on planning. And I would even add that the development of the online services would benefit from collaborating with librarians who have to help people navigate these kind of uh, apps. They're not all so simple. Uh, uh, and, and the libraries would make great design partners in the first place for this stuff. Um, so uh, really good, uh, Diane, you, you, you also kind of illuminate the scope, the span of types of circumstances that, that different libraries have. You know, these, large systems, you know, everything is closed, still closed, smaller areas, uh, you know, different circumstances. So that's, you know, that's the library world. They, they serve their communities and their communities are different. So libraries are different and, and they, and they have to tailor that way at the same time, the, this kind of the solidarity across the, the profession and around the world in, in very similar kind of issues. Um, uh, Anybody want to weigh in here uh, on how they're dealing with all this? Anyone like uh, like Stephen in Toronto? Are you still on? Abram? While well, he's maybe not on. Uh, oh, Steve, I, I'm Abram. here, Don. Oh. I just. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, I was just uh, contemplating Diane's comment about uh, the platform for delivering this kind of training, and and one thing we did in Canada, since this is such an international session, is we sought and received uh, an investment from the province to build a single e-learning platform for uh, the entire library sector in Ontario. So we have uh, all of our training put into a single platform. Uh, and it's, it's called uh, Learn HQ. And then we have a Governance HQ to help our boards. And it's integrated into the single platform that includes mentorship strategies, training strategies, uh, I think we're up to about 9,000, 10,000 courses now. And we also integrate all of our uh, provincial library association sessions into it. And it, uh, it simplified the delivery of this stuff. And part of the justification for it was because 19 of the G20 countries have uh, single payer um, 
social medicine systems, this reduces the cost because we did it on uh, justifications and research we did on emergency room divergent, diversion and chronic healthcare issues because librarians fear the emergency healthcare and rightly so and giving medical advice but it's quite different when we start looking at our collections from what do we do for chronic conditions, such as uh, um, arthritis and rheumatism and all the and social isolation and all the loneliness things that make people with arthritis show up in emergency rooms instead of being in the care of their doctor or adjusting their diet or things like that. And so we we made it in the government's best interest to talk to emergency room diversion. And then we talked to uh, how we could deal with preventative healthcare through public libraries. So nutrition, anti-poverty strategies, and the determinants of uh, social medicine that uh, ensure that the population is healthy and that we participate without leading uh, public health measures. And it helped us in the pandemic as well. Anyway, that's just my comment. And I think it's, uh, I'm quite proud of what we did. We started it with a vision for 2020 and 2025 that it uh, integrated over 20 organizations who were leading on providing training to library workers of all types. And there's such a huge mess between techniques programs and master's programs and frontline service personnel, customer service programming. Uh, how do we get it all in one? And it was pretty good. Wow. Well, you, you raised the, the shade on what is really a massive uh, topic, and that, that's basically that we've moved into a, actually into an information age where services come as information as much as they do in any other form. And that takes a science and a, and a platform and a systematic way of doing it. And I think this is both awesome and uh, maybe a little bit alarming that we're not looking at things so comprehensively and it's kind of piecemeal here and there. So I think we may want to hear you illuminate that, uh, that whole process, Stephen, at, a, at another date. Uh, well, what, one thing we discovered in our statistics was during the pandemic, uh, the use of our e-learning environment uh, doubled and on some courses tripled. So right. a lot of library CEOs push their staff to invest. So we're coming out of the pandemic with a significant plateau shift on the capabilities of library workers because they invested a lot of time in uh, uh, fixing their skills and improving their skills. And all I think right. a lot of American librarians did too. I know that all the associations saw a lot of people investing a lot more in uh, learning online learning modalities, which is great because then they're, they have the experience to talk to their patrons about and how the benefit works. And we all know that per personal recommendations will move people there all the way. Indeed, yeah. Uh, trusted recommendations from people you know, people around you at the local level as, as was earlier pointed out. Well, you've just set up a whole session uh, with that brief uh, comment there, Stephen. Thank you. It's, we're we're going to go back to that. I think it's really important uh, uh, area. Uh, before I turn it back over to Stephen Weiber for a final word, I just wanted to point out that uh, this is this has been a special session that we just put together as a result of all the excellent information we got just last Friday from Nick and Annie and Diane and and uh, Craig Settles. Uh, which I recommend uh, for the recording. Tomorrow, which will be our regular session, uh, we have um, uh, a report from Lisa Guernsey at the New America Foundation, the Open Technology Institute there, on this study, uh, Libraries in the Pandemic. It's a fantastic document. If you haven't registered, the link is on the registration page. I uh, urge you to, to uh, tune in for that. And keeping up with our international uh, flavor here, we're going to have a presentation from China. Uh, library professor there, Professor uh, uh, Sophia Xu, will come on and, and talk about how 
the pandemic generally has been treated and dealt with by libraries in China. And also she'll highlight a, uh, a project that they're doing that sounds like that, uh, that the libraries are curating a whole collection of, for a home library and then delivering a full home library to, to patrons' homes. So that'll be interesting to see how they do that and how they manage that. And it'll be interesting to hear. She's staying up late for us. It'll be 11 p.m. Beijing time tomorrow. I don't think she's in Beijing, but they all they only have one time zone for for China. Um, so that that should be that should be a very interesting session. I hope you can make it for that. And also, I want to say one more thing about uh, uh, emails. I apologize for all the emails you've gotten. Something probably every day from us saying, well on Thursday and then tomorrow in an hour, all that. It's just kind of the way we've done it. We've tried to minimize your, your email box, but when we did double up like we did this week, you tend to get more than you get double the email. So um, you're gonna get one more next week that's not related to this session. It's gonna be a survey. We're gonna send out our first survey for feedback. It's not that we're confident of uh, knowing what everybody is interested in. We've just used a running you know, how many people show up to a particular session that kind of giving us feedback. So uh, we will do a, a survey out next Wednesday, look for that, and we'll be interested in anybody's response. So before I turn it back to Stephen uh, uh, Weiber to close out, because he's really engineered this session, is there anything our, uh, our, our past speakers from last session wanted to add anything else before we, before we close? Nobody. I mean, you all good stuff. I really appreciate you coming back for this. I, I think we've we've captured a lot more interesting stuff. So, okay, I'll turn it over to you, Stephen Stephen Weiber, to to wrap us up. Any final thoughts? How's it? How does this feel when you what you're hearing from other national associations or anywhere else? So I I I I'll, I'll, I'll keep it short. Um, it does. I know it. it I think, as you've said, and as, as so many people have said, there's there's lots of there's so much really good work going on. There's so many lessons to be shared. I know that, especially in an area like health, clearly the way that things are organised is different. Um, some countries are far more centralised, others less. It'll be, I don't know, one thing I've written down that is the idea that we should be trying to encourage all other government agencies that rely on people actually being able to understand what they're doing and rely on some in some way on information in order to actually ensure the effectiveness of their policies should be paying a sort of 0.5% or 1% in order to ensure that you have a strong library infrastructure there in order to deliver on that information. Uh, that, that's obviously fantasy, um, but trying to work towards that where you can make sure that it's not libraries, not only for health, but for other issues are, are not being taken for granted, that they're not being seen as a free lunch would be really interesting. So I, I don't know, as, as you've said a fair number of times, this is this is a rich area. There's so much more we can do to dig down and to learn how we can actually convince others to see that, I don't know, not just that we can sit there and, and, and take life for granted, but we actually make those investments to make sure that libraries really can provide, can, really can realise their potential. So definitely good luck in Delaware. Um, I hope you, you can raise on, on 10,000 per library. Um, hopefully the examples in Australia provide a, a good model showing that yes, this is a country, a G20 country that at the federal le level has decided to invest. And obviously hope to see similar things going on elsewhere. So I think with that, thank you to everyone. Thank you to Don for, for, for putting together this entire series, for taking the initiative. And I will stop the recording there. <laughs>